Today is Tuesday, April 25th, 2006. We are at Orchard Park High School with... Mike Sullivan. Joe Podgorski. Brad Schumann. And we are interviewing Joe Podgorski, a veteran of the Vietnam War. Have a good time. Learn a lot about the life of a soldier, and I'll be back. Right. You have about a half an hour. Okay, okay. great. That's good. I'm planning to join the military. Are you really? Okay. Yes. Which branch? Marine Corps. Okay. All right. So, were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I was in ROTC in college. ROTC. Yeah, in so, college. yeah, I was commissioned uh, at grad for graduation. And That's what I'm going for. ROTC. It's a good program. Yeah. And um, where were you living at the time? In the city of Buffalo. What, uh, what branch did you join? The Army. The Army. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. uh, why did you join? The ROTC program was Army ROTC. So it wasn't the college where I went to I mean, why, why did you pick uh, <coughs> military? Well, it, actually at the time it was kind of interesting. Uh, there was no physical education program at Canisius College so that in order to satisfy state requirements, everybody had to be in ROTC the first two years that fulfilled the phys ed requirement for college graduation. <clears throat> and I was in the band in, um, I was in the band in college, the ROTC band in college. And so for me, it seemed like a good deal to, to, to stay in. I mean, I was enjoying playing. I was enjoying the, you know, the ROTC stuff. And uh, the, it, it looked to me as if the draft was coming. <laughs> so I said, if I'm gonna go in the military, I'm going in as an officer, not as an enlisted man. So, uh, you know, I decided to, to stay for the full four years and get my commission. What what year was this? I graduated in 1965. 65? Oh, yeah. The draft coming right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As it turns out, I had kind of a marginal number. I could have either gone or not gone, depending. I don't remember what actually happened. I stopped paying attention, but I was kind of in the middle. <laughs> yeah, my next-door neighbor went up for the draft thing for Vietnam. He was down in Florida training, and he got sites for an officer school. Then they skipped him the draft and they saved him from going to Vietnam because the time he spent in officer school, mm. like war ended and stuff. Yeah. But he still stayed in and whatnot. Do you recall your first days in service? I do. Uh, I recall my very first day in active duty because I was married and had a little daughter and um, was going to Fort Eustis, Virginia. And remember getting up uh, very early in the morning because I had to be there. I didn't want to leave any earlier than I had to. And I almost hit a deer near Dansville. So I remember, <laughs> I remember that, that very vividly. That deer ran out in front of my car about quarter after five in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, you know, never having really lived away from home before for any extended period of time like that. I mean, I was at ROTC summer camp and, and stuff like that. But, uh, and having to go by myself for I think the first maybe four weeks or five weeks, you couldn't have family with you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I remember that. So was it a buck or a doe? Uh, it was a doe. Uh, well, people ask you, when My you get them with you, would be like an uh, engine shot? No, I didn't want to, I didn't want to hit it, that's for sure. <laughs> then I would have been late for reporting of duty and that would have been a trouble right from the get-go. <laughs> so, um, tell me about your uh, boot camp training and experiences. Well, when you're in ROTC, uh, between your junior and senior year, you go to uh, camp for six weeks. And, and I went to Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania near Harrisburg. And uh, they put you through pretty much the same basic training that enlisted men go through. In fact, we had all, almost all of our, uh, our, our trainers were, were enlisted men. Uh, so we went through that particular program for six weeks. Then uh, after uh, you get commissioned when you go on active duty, you go to what they call officer basic, and then they put you through things that are uh, general, but also more specific to your military occupational specialty. So I was in transportation corps, so they put us through a bunch of transportation training, uh, whether they taught you, uh, the transportation corps is interesting, they have helicopters, they have boats, which is you know kind of unusual. And so they, and, and trains, and they kind of gave you a basic foundation in how you know, the, the Army Transportation Corps interacts with trucks and boats and planes and trains. Uh, so that was nine weeks, I think, of, of officer basic. They also teach you the things that you need to know as an officer. 
you know, the no-nos, the do's and don'ts, those kinds of things. Uh, take you through training because if there's a court martial of somebody, you may have to serve as their attorney because they don't get a, a they don't necessarily get a lawyer as an attorney; they get an officer as an attorney. So we went through some of that training too. So it was kind of well, interesting. Well, wasn't there a J program back then, or is it? Yeah, but they're you know if you get some of the lower level court marshals, oh. they're not going to assign a lawyer; they're going to assign a, an officer. An officer, yeah. Yeah. You were your instructors. I remember. I remember one guy who was. Uh, yeah, I do. I remember one guy who was a corporal when we were doing mortar training, and uh, he he admonished us. He said, "If you're going to be, if I'm going to take orders from you, you better know what you're doing." And one of the reasons I remember him, his last name was Worlds. He was Worlds Roman numeral two, Worlds the <laughs> second, and they were from the the 101st Airborne. Yeah. That were our trainers. And they were good. They were very good. Military training is exceptionally good. Especially the Marine Corps. Well, all of it. I mean, I was a training supervisor in Virginia, and that was, it was good. And where in uh, Vietnam were you stationed? I was stationed at Cameron Bay. Cameron Bay? Yeah. C-A-M, capital R-A-N-H, Cameron Bay, which is one of the best deep water ports in the world. And it was a, a huge base the army was a very small component uh, there was a huge air force base there and there was a big navy base there and uh, so there were a lot of cargo ships that were coming in and, and I think my recollection is that that on at Cameron Bay and the whole complex there were like 50,000 Americans so like 10 percent of all the Americans who were there at the time were at Cameron Bay between the air force the navy and the army do you remember first arriving in there what it was like there? <clears throat> sure uh, yeah I just my ex-wife had just had a second baby so I was leaving two little kids home. And um, I flew out of Travis Air Force Base in San Francisco. And I remember landing in the middle of the night in Japan and uh, not being able to see anything, it was dark, but getting out of the airplane because we had to wait while I refueled and smelling the cherry blossoms because it was in April and it really was. I remember that smell to this day. And then we were, I was supposed to go into Saigon and the air base was being mortared. So they diverted the plane to Cameron Bay plane landed at Cameron Bay and they were looking for, in my in the replacement battalion where I ended up staying, they were looking for a non-combat arms officer with some kind of education training and I was the right guy. I stayed right there. I stayed right in the replacement unit for the whole year that I was that I was there. So it was, it was fortunate. I think if, if the air base hadn't been attacked in Saigon, I would have had an entirely different life. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what specific job in San you were given? Yeah, I was the executive officer in a in a replacement company, and our jobs our job basically was to meet incoming soldiers at the airport at the airport when they came in by mostly 707s, and then bring them back to our unit, put them up while they're waiting for their orders, and give them in country orientations, which lasted probably an hour an hour and a half. Uh, and we were getting in, I would guess, on average, probably three plane loads full a day. Three plane loads full a day. Yeah. And then the other uh, thing we did was we, when people were going back to the United States, we would put them up, billet them, and, and uh, get them on their airplanes and send them home. So we were doing that. And we, my unit dealt only with E-5s and up, which are buck sergeants and up. The, uh, another company in our battalion dealt with the privates and corporals. So I had everything from sergeants to generals going through our unit. Uh, did you see any combat while you were in Vietnam? Nope. No. <laughs> the closest I came, this is an interesting story too, the closest I ever came was uh, the Air Force officers had a very nice officers club. And uh, I know there's a question here about food later, so I'll, maybe I'll preempt it. But once in a while we would go down there to have something to eat in the evening when it started to cool down a little bit. And coming back uh, one night, we're in a Jeep, I think there were probably three of us, and we had flip-flops and tank tops and a pair of shorts. And also, all of a sudden, the airbase was getting mortared. It was the only time the air, the airbase had never been hit up until that point. And the airbase was being mortared. And what they tell you to do in a mortar attack is drive perpendicular to the mortar attack. So I just hit the gas and you know, we went, to, uh, we went back to our unit, which was probably five miles away. And I went into the, uh, the night duty officer and I said to him, Elliot, the airbase is being hit. And he goes, yeah, right. When he went outside, the whole sky was orange because they hit one of those big 55,000 gallon tanks of jet fuel. Uh -huh. And boom, the whole thing went up, you know. Uh -huh. So the whole sky was orange from that thing burning. 
And that's the only time that uh, that base was hit while I was there. I think it might have been hit one other time. Uh, we were protected on, it was on a peninsula, and cutting off the peninsula were White Horse Koreans. A peninsula, where, where exactly uh, is Cameron? Right now? Cameron Bay is about halfway down. It's south of, uh, of uh, Cunyon and, um, and the Trang and uh, north of Saigon, probably 180 miles north of Saigon. I but it's right on, the, right on the ocean. Yeah, it comes down like this, you'd be thought. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly, yeah. And so this, the White Horse Koreans were protecting our, our flank. And then across the bay, the bay was pretty wide, across the bay there were always special forces sweeps to keep that from happening because there was so much uh, you know, between airplanes and fuel and personnel and so on, that was a prime target. So, it would, we were pretty well protected. Uh, can you tell us about any other memorable experiences you had? Yeah, yeah, I can tell you another one. I mean, there are a lot, there are lots, but another one that is related to what I think was stupidity on the part of the way we conducted the war. Um, when you, when we left Cameron Bay, when we left the peninsula. You could not be in a vehicle by yourself. You had to have somebody riding shotgun in the vehicle. So uh, one time our supply sergeant asked me, he was going to go on the train, which is about 30 miles away, to pick up some stuff. And he said, you want to go with me and ride shotgun? I said, sure, I'll go with you. So here we are. The night before, there had been a barracks attacked by the Viet Cong in the train, right in the city of the train. And it was a small city, about the size of Batavia. And um, we got, so we're, we're very apprehensive because it's, the, the road is in a valley and there's, there's hills on both sides, and so you're in kind of a sh shooting, shooting gallery if, you, if somebody wanted to. So we're a little apprehensive all the way, and we got to the train and went to the MP station, and they said, you have to turn in your weapons. I said, turn in your weapons? Yes, sir. I said, we're officers, doesn't matter. No, what, you can't carry weapons inside the city limits in the train. I said, last night, this barracks got shot up, and we still can't carry weapons, no, sir. So we had to turn our weapons in, and that was really, I just never understood that. But we also, where I was stationed at Camera, uh, weren't allowed to have weapons at all. I mean, all the, all the weapons were locked up. They said, oh yeah, well if there's an attack, we'll let you get them. Yeah. They, were all, they were locked up in an arms room. And we all had the old M14s, which were, you know, not state of the art for sure. The go carbine rifles before the M16s. Yeah, the M16s were, were just coming in. Yeah, well, the AR-15s when they first came in. AR-15s, we had been trained on them, but but we didn't get to see them. Yeah. So fortunately, uh, you know where I was, we were pretty safe. Mm -hmm. I don't. I I don't get that. That kind of startles me. I mean, you know, it's, uh, Vietnamese were coming mm -hmm. out of the ground. They were coming. Yep. They were blending with yep. the population. I mean, they just start shooting you. No way to it was one so. of the paradoxes of the war. Mm -hmm. The other thing. Uh, the other thing that was scary to me was um, because we were a small unit. Uh, we were pulling off through the guard probably every six days where we'd be on for like 36 hours. And I was unfortunate enough to be the officer of the guard the first night of the Tet Offensive in 1968. <laughs> and so um, here I, I get these guys off the airplanes just coming into Vietnam and never been there before. And we handed them weapons and put them on the perimeter. <laughs> I told them, I said, I don't want to get shot by you guys. And if I find anybody who chambers around without being given orders, I said, you're going to be court-martialed. And what really scared me was I was afraid that they were going to, you know, see like the Koreans moving around and start shooting at the Koreans. So that was pretty scary because we, when I went out to check the guard, it was a pretty wide, pretty long perimeter that we had, and uh, we had to go with a jeep with the lights out. They had these cat-eye things that they caused so they could see you coming, but uh, you, you couldn't have any headlights. So. Uh, it was really, I was really nervous that the, one of these guys was going to get trigger happy because they had been reading in Stars and Stripes, which was the Army magazine, about uh, or newspaper about what this is, what's going to happen, and Tet's going to be this, and Tet's going to be that. They were scared to die. So that was another time that I was nervous. Any other memorable experiences that you'd like to share? No, I, I just, <laughs> it was, it was hot. Where I was stationed, it was hot. It wasn't jungle, per se. It was sand, and so when it when the temperature got up to be 115 or 120, because you had the air temperature plus the temp heat radiating off the sand, it was pretty darn hot. And and I would say that if you changed your uniform within five minutes, you sweated through it. You were just always uh, always hot. And even in the in the monsoon season, the monsoons are 
amazing. They are like standing under, the heavy rains are like standing under Niagara Falls. You could not see three feet. It would rain so hard and it would rain for days and days at a time. And uh, it was just, it was incredible. And the temperature would get down at night to like 70 degrees and your teeth would chatter because you were used to the heat. And you know, your, your blood had thinned out and, and you'd be out, and you'd, even with a field jacket on, you were cold. It must have been horrible. I don't it was, really like heat, so. Yeah, it was okay. I mean, it was, but it was just something that, you know, coming from Buffalo, you weren't used to 150 <laughs> degrees. Um, the, the Army provided some nice recreational facilities uh, where we were. They had, they had some boats with fishing poles. They had volleyball nets and stuff like that. So the guys who were waiting to either go home or go to their unit uh, weren't bored out of their mind. They didn't start to drink and fight and whatever. So they, they provided some recreation. Fishing, you know? I didn't fish. I water skied once because there weren't many troops going back and forth uh, at Christmas time. So we had access to the boat and I water skied once. Another thing that was huge was Bob Hope came to Cameron Bay while I was there. And so did President Johnson. Did you go to see Bob? I let all my troops go and I stayed behind in the office. Oh. Oh. I did, I did. I would love to have seen Bob Hope. But these guys, you know, these, I had a lot of kids working for me and, and some sergeants who had been in a long time. And I said, go, I'll stay back and answer the phone. Uh, when, and, and we had to get bodyguards and people volunteered just to go and protect Bob Hope, but when President Johnson came, they couldn't find too many people who were who were willing to volunteer as bodyguards. They had to kind of say, you're going, you're going, you're going. I'm not too sure, but when, when Boston did they find out that right underneath Bob Hope, the underground, the North Koreans were, the North Vietnamese, and they were having their own little celebration? Oh, I don't know. That was on the History Channel, but that was pretty cool. Like right underneath the stage, all our soldiers were on. I didn't see North that. Koreans, like thousands of them inside their little tunnels, celebrating out. Name that guy from China. So from China? Yeah, China. So bring him. Mao Zedong. Yeah, and the uh, leader of North Vietnam. Oh, Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. So those are kind. Of, those are kind of neat experiences. Uh, yeah. Um, were you awarded any medals or citations? Yeah, I got the Army Commendation Medal, which is I was put in for Bronze Star for uh, meritorious service, and got the Army Commendation Medal. So I have that. Sure. I didn't bring the citation that went with it. There's also a certificate that, that goes with it. And uh, how did you get those? Recommended by your commanding officer. Uh, you got uh, anything else you want to show us? Sure. Uh, this is a little manual that we gave to the guys who came into the country. We use this as part of our orientation. Mm -hmm. And it showed, for example, uh, uniforms of the Vietnamese so you know which ones were officers and which ones were enlisted men and it had some little uh, history in it and it had some language uh, you know a little vocabulary and, and things like that so we gave that to the people who came in a little bit about the customs of Vietnam useful phrases stuff like that when before we went over we had to get so many shots <laughs> in the back that you saw that right? every every week during my junior and senior year, we got filled up with shots. They, it, I mean, they gave us shots for everything. And so you can see, the, uh, some of these plague shots were in, in Vietnam, January 68. They used to get plague epidemics in the village nurse. And uh, every time the, the plague started to spread, they'd make us get another plague shot. Um, About like also for like malaria? Oh yeah, small, uh, cholera, smallpox, typhoid, tetanus, yellow fever, uh, typhus, and uh, then all these plague shots and polio shot, polio boosters, and all this stuff. That's a lot of shots. A lot of shots, and um, what I'll tell you the way Cameron Bay worked, at least where we were, we had Vietnamese people working for us all during the day, uh, in the officers' clubs, in the in the BOQs, and so on. And at night, they would put them on trucks and they would take them to what they call Cameron Village and they would lock them up behind barbed wire. So they couldn't sabotage anything, but that's how they, they treated, uh, treated the Vietnamese who worked for us. Uh, I'll show you this. This is a, this is a guy that, that I was in service with and his wife and their son. Uh, I corresponded with him for like 15 years and I kind of lost track of him. But he was, this girl, was half Chinese and half Vietnamese, and was sold into prostitution by her father. She ran away before 
she got to her destination and was turned over to a chaplain in our unit. And he got her a job at our officer's club. And Blaine was probably 22, 23, and she was probably 16 or 17 at the time. And you couldn't bring back Vietnamese brides. So he, was, uh, he had a degree in agricultural engineering and came back to the States, got a job with the United States uh, in, what a, Agricultural Development Agency or whatever it was, went back to Vietnam, married her, brought her back and her brother, and then they had this, this little boy who's probably 25, 27 now. Uh, he was from Tampa, Florida. They, they were living in Tampa, Florida last I, I saw. Um, my patch from Fort Log Command in Fort Lee, Virginia, which is uh, Quartermaster Corps, U.S. Army, Vietnam. These patches later became camouflage. When we first were over there, they were, uh, this was the U.S. Army Vietnam patch. Uh, my dog tags are here. My name tag, which was on my Class A uniform in the United States, but in Vietnam it was all sewn on. We had fatigues all the time. It was sewn on and camouflage. Military payment certificate. This stuff is kind of interesting, another scary moment. Uh, you didn't get paid in dollars. You get paid in uh, MPC, military payment certificates. Same denominations as a dollar. And uh, this, was the, this was legal tender on the military posts. And I was payroll officer uh, one month, and I had to drive like 15 miles to pick up the pay and then come back and deliver it. Well, this stuff is legal tender. I was carrying $110,000 in 1968, which was a lot of money. And was very relieved when I got back to my unit without getting <laughs> ambushed by, by somebody. Uh, Vietnamese money, piastres, they call it. Uh, some paper money, some coins. Is that uh, South Vietnamese money? South Vietnamese money, yeah. Uh, coins as well. It's pretty much the same. You know, they're based on on the on the hundreds. So this is these are 50, 50 dong. This is um, one, five, ten. You know, same kind of base uh, decimal base is our money. So you were on, when you're going on the economy. If you use the Vietnamese money, and when you're in the military bases, you use this. But there were no, supposed to be no American currency exchange. Uh, this, I've got my transportation, uh, brass, my first lieutenant's bar, a, car, a tech card that I got from a Vietnamese bartender, barmaid, who gave some tech cards to, this is Tet 68, cards to some of the officers that she liked. Her name was George, and her brother's her sister's name was Mike. They <laughs> couldn't pronounce the Vietnamese name. What, so uh, what is oh, this? that's just that's just my qualification badge for our, for rifle and the National Defense Medal, which everybody in the service gets when you're on, when you first go on. I know I couldn't find my Vietnam Service Medal. We had two of those things, but all the people who went to Vietnam had you probably have seen them on cars. Uh, one of them is green and white, and one of them is is yellow with red and green. Uh, and that's uh, it'll say Vietnam vet or something, and it'll have one of those one of those medals on it because that's what they were they gave us. What kind of uh, information did they put on your dog tags? My blood type. <laughs> uh, I think name, serial number, and blood type, pretty much, and religion. Yeah, that's what it is. Name, name, serial number, blood type, and religion. Um, how did you t did you stay in touch with your family? Writing. And I think uh, a couple of times uh, there were ham radio operators that would help you to connect with the states, but because of the way the thing worked, and they didn't have satellites back then, so the way things worked, it was very difficult uh, to be able to call to call home. And so guys would do it maybe once or twice during the whole year that they were there. Uh, but letter writing, and it would take about a week each way, between five days and a week each way for letters to go. Yeah. How much of pressure and stress did you have while you were over there? For me, I would say not a lot. I mean, the, the biggest thing for me was working 12 hour days, six and a half days a week. We'd get a half a day off, and then I was pulling that officer of the guard every six days. So it was really a lot of time. And on the other hand, it filled up your time. So. Now, can uh, you explain exactly what officer of the guard is? Yeah, well, you have to. You, you defend the, the perimeter of your, your, like our battalion area. We had to defend the perimeter so of the area. So the guys were guarding the perimeter of the area you were Yeah, you were in charge of that, and, and it was a nighttime situation. The daytime, they didn't have it. But you officer the guard, you were the officer on duty for the battalion during the night. Most Vietnamese attacks came at night. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and we were uh, part of our perimeter was on the South China Sea, so that was a big a big issue because uh, uh, one of the things the Viet Cong used to do would be to float up in the sampans, those little flat boats. You know, they float up to the shore and then they attack from the shore. But so we have concertina wire, which is that curly barbed wire, and uh, there was one. Uh, we had one bunker up there. It was like an observation post that was that was there. Uh, how, how did you guys uh, entertain yourselves? Uh, there was an officers club, enlisted men's club, an NCO club, so there were clubs there. Uh, when I first got there, it was really small. I mean, the officers club was half the size of this room. Then the Air Force opened a big one at the air base, and uh, then we opened a big one probably, I don't know, maybe six months into the time that I was there. Uh, once in a while, they bring entertainment in. You know, they bring usually from the Philippines. There'd be some, sometimes American entertainment, but they bring in some rock bands from the Philippines or whatever. Bob Hope was probably one of the best things they did. Yeah, I would say so, yeah. Um, done a lot for morale. And, you know, guys used to play cards a lot. Where we were, uh, like I used to work, I hated working the night shift, but most of the time I was working six in the morning until six at night. And, you know, guys would get off duty and they'd play, you know, uh, touch football and, or volleyball. You know, just to, there's a basketball court there, so they'd blow off some steam doing that. Uh, when you went on leave, were some of the places you weren't? I just went to Hawaii, not my family in Hawaii. Hawaii? Mm -hmm. Good place to go. Yeah, one of the reasons I did that was that was the longest leave. <laughs> r and it was, it was seven days. And uh, some of them were, like, if you went to Hong Kong, I think it was only three days or four days, so I took the longest one. I could did take. you get to see Pearl while you were there? Pearl Harbor. You know, I, well, I went to Pearl Harbor, but I didn't want to go on the tour. It just kind of freaked me out. And uh, I was there in 1998. <clears throat> I was back in Hawaii, and my father-in-law, who was a World War II vet, uh, was with us on the trip. And we all went, you know, we went and did the, the full tour of Pearl Harbor, so I, I saw it done. Where did you travel when you were in the service? I was only in Virginia and then Vietnam. What were some uh, pranks you guys pulled? I had a roommate who was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> he really was. <laughs> uh, one I won't repeat. <laughs> but uh, there were, I know one time there was an officer staying in one of the BOQs who was really obnoxious. And uh, my roommate had, a, had this huge stereo system. And like at bedtime, he kept blasting the Star Spangled Banner on the stereo system. <laughs> Just to get this guy in the way. <laughs> and the guy came over and he started chewing on him. He was a captain, I think. And, and he started chewing on my roommate. And my roommate kept giving him this ceremonial sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Just sarcastically, yes, sir. And just got the guy <laughs> infuriated. Just got him infuriated. But, you know, being officers, we didn't pull too many pranks. I won't repeat the other one he did. <laughs> it's not fit for family consumption. Imagine. What did you think of uh, officers and your fellow soldiers and stuff? <clears throat> I had, I was in a really interesting situation. I had about five non-commissioned officers working under me, um, all of whom had served in Korea, one of whom had served in World War II also, and they knew so much. I mean, they had so much experience, and I had, I had a lot of respect for them. It must um, have been also something you would end up being in command of them. Then. I knew enough to shut my mouth and listen. <laughs> you know, I learned that very quickly. You, know, you 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 go there, and I mean, you make the decisions, but you get all the input you can from these NCOs who have all this experience. And also, uh, and I don't know whether it was particular to the kind of jobs that we were doing, but uh, I had uh, some uh, like Spec Force, uh, E Force, working for me who had some college. And one guy had an associate's degree, another guy had a year of college, and they were they were sharp guys too. So I really, I really enjoyed the people I, I worked with. There were a couple officers who were like uh, Frank Burns on Mash, you know, <laughs> this Major Taylor who was uh, uh, he was one of the battalion officers. I can't remember what his job was, but he was they used to call him Chicken Man because he always ran around like a chicken with his head cut off, just trying <laughs> to do this stupid stuff. And we had a general coming one time to inspect. We had an inspection, and we were—I told you guys—we were all sand. And he had—he had all these detail men, where the guys who were waiting to be shipped, raking the sand north to south, so that all the ruts in the sand were going in the same direction to please the general. And also, we had—we didn't have toilets. We had 
55 gallon drums that were cut in half and then put underneath a bench, it was sort of like camp. And uh, so they got pretty smelly at one point. And then what they used to do to uh, clean them up is they used to pour kerosene in them and then burn them to you know, turn them into ashes. But when the general was coming, this Major Taylor would not let anybody burn latrines out. So the smell was overpowering. He didn't want the general to be exposed to the smoke while well, he was exposed to the stench of the latrines. It really smelled. But that's the kind of wacky stuff he would do. Just like Frank Burns. I mean, he was, when I came home and MASH was on, I said, oh my God, there's Major Taylor. <laughs> Did you uh, rough him up like they did with Burns? Did I, I'm sorry? Did, I, did you uh, prank sound him and stuff like they did with Major Burns? Uh, the one, yeah, <laughs> the one, I, yeah, I can tell you part of the story I wouldn't tell you. Uh, we had these white helmet liners with, uh, with the battalion crest on one side and the U.S. Army Vietnam crest on the other side. And we were required to wear these helmet liners. If they'd show that you were like cadre uh, for the battalion. And my roommate, my roommate stole this guy's helmet liner, this major's helmet liner, and he snapped on it. And he just kind of like jumped up and down, I hate Major Taylor. And he threw it up on top of our BOQ, which was two stories. I won't tell you what he did with it to desecrate it, but he did. He threw it up on the top of the BOQ. And uh, every, I think everybody in the battalion knew that except Major Taylor. Guys would go walking by and they'd go, yep, still up there. Well, he, Major Taylor, Came and oh, that thing flipped. You gotta flip it, right? I think it just went off. Yeah. Yeah. There's only a few minutes left in the period, too. Okay. Uh, Major Taylor came, and I think it was New Year's, my, if I recall. Major Taylor came blowing into my room at like three o'clock in the morning, looking for my roommate who wasn't there. He said, "Where's my check?" I said, "I don't know where he is. I don't know where he is. Where's my helmet liner?" And he, they turned the room upside down looking for this helmet liner. We never, never found it. So that was that was pretty cute. Never found it? Never found it. <laughs> yeah, your recorder doesn't seem to be working. The period just ended. Yeah, I'm in March. So. We can go a little bit over. We'll yeah, she said you could go over. We'll wrap it up quick. That's right. Do uh, you recall when the uh, war ended? Or your last days? Oh my god, yeah, my last days. Because you know, because we were in charge of sending people home, uh, we, we were able to pull a little rank, and another guy from my unit and I were going home together. And we got on the airplane early, so we got the front seats that had about two inches more leg room. Uh, and during the time we were on the plane, there was a blackout. There was a rumor that the air base was going to be hit. So here we are sitting on a 747 waiting, or 707 waiting to go home, and there's a blackout. We're saying, oh, oh God, you know, not now, not, not when I'm going home. <clears throat> and. Um, when I, I remember taking off, and once we got over the South China Sea, I knew because of American air support that we were that we were in good shape, and I could rela I relaxed a now, little bit. Now, they had a blackout, and feared that the city might get bombed, and you were stuck Fear in it, and you were stuck in a plane. Yeah, on the on the, run, on the apron of the runway. Yeah, that must have been scary. Yeah, it was a little scary. <laughs> a little scary. Uh, did you have any close friendships that um, are still going on today? Not today, but I showed you the picture of the of the, the one fella. I remember a couple of years ago, like around Christmas time, I went on the internet and I, I was trying to find some of the some of the people that I liked when I was there. We kind of went our own way, you know. Have you ever attended uh, any reunions yet? No. no. Don't know of any. If you had, I would have gone. Yeah, somebody had one. Um, did you join a veterans organization? No. Uh, what did you do after the war? I went back to teaching. I taught for a year in the city of Buffalo uh, prior to going on active duty. And uh, so as soon as I got got off active duty, I went back to my teaching job. I was in reserves for two years after that. How did your military experience influence your thinking about wars and military in general? Well, I guess there were doubts in my own mind. I was a history major in college. There were doubts in my own mind about whether or not the Vietnam War made any sense uh, while it was going on. And I think I came back still thinking it was a political war and that the Vietnamese people, I don't think, cared who won the war. They just wanted the fighting to stop. And I don't I think that the peasants were just as would have been just as bad or just as well off under Ho Chi Minh as they would have been under whatever government that you know the United States would have supported down there. So I think for the average Vietnamese it really didn't make much difference. There was a lot of corruption that went on though uh, and I think a, a number of Vietnamese got very wealthy with black marketeering and stuff like that. Oh yeah, especially they were in the Viet Cong selling to the North Vietnamese. Yeah, some stuff that was on boats never made it. Mm -hmm. 
never made it. Tom Major, where they did make it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I think we need to wrap it up, guys. So, okay. Later. Any uh, last things you'd like to add in the interview? Oh, boy. I don't know. I, I thank you guys for doing this. Um, getting back to your last question, I think it when the thing in Iraq started, you know, I said to my wife, this looks like Vietnam all over again. And it looks like it's turning out that way. It's a little bit different, but there are no front lines and you don't know who the enemy is and it's, you know, a political kind of war and they're trying to military solution to a political problem. So um, you're supposed to learn from your mistakes. And I'm not sure we did. Thank you. Okay, we need some You're pictures welcome. now. So. Okay. Is that okay, guys? Yeah. It was great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It still doesn't work.